But in order to do that, we have to know about the past. So when I started at NASA, uh, we had the first rover land on Mars in 1994. It, it wasn't, yeah, it was robotics, right? So it landed on Mars. Um, the scientists would want to go to a rock that was maybe, you know, one meter away. And we would do this whole planning sequence of, okay, we're going to go one centimeter this way, we're going to turn 20 degrees, and we're going to continue. And then the next day, we look at the images, and it was like, oh, directions were wrong. Right? That was the AI. It was human intelligence, not artificial intelligence. And so when I started in thinking about how do you enable these rovers of the next generation, these future Mars rover missions, what does that look like? What does it mean to be intelligent? What does it actually mean? And so, trying to figure this out, this was a new, this was a new planet. We hadn't sent people there. Um, we hadn't, the astronauts had not landed yet, or even now. So how do you do this artificial intelligence when you don't have the data? You don't know. So I looked at how we did it here on Earth. There's actually people here on Earth who do exploration. They're archeologists. They're biologists that try to understand the science of, of new life. And so I decided what I was going to do is take a team of scientists, explorers, and literally dump them in the middle of the desert and see how do they explore it with one objective is find life. And so we will watch these scientists navigate and, and look at features in the train. When they have cameras, we retrofit them, trying to extract the intelligence of the human so that we can apply it to our rovers. And that was the past of artificial intelligence. We didn't know how to do it. We didn't have all of this data that we have now. All we had was people and us, and we had to figure out how to extract. And so that was back, way back in the 90s. Now, it's amazing and so much more different and exciting. And so I design robots that work with people still, and there's one key difference. So back then, when we were doing robotics, there was a whole field of artificial intelligence. And I was a roboticist, and you have these AI folks. And as a roboticist, we built stuff, and we made it work. And the folks in the AI world, they, uh, we always said, they play with imaginary things and virtual apps and simulators and toy problems. And of course, nothing ever really worked. And then something switched over the years. And now what's happening is, is that this artificial intelligence, the ability to do interesting things with data, has blended with robotics of really doing something interesting in the real world. And so when we think about AI and robotics, and it's used interchangeably now, the reason is because it really doesn't matter if it's robotics or it's AI, it's about what we can do with it, and how does it function, and how can it provide value to our lives. And this is the Dow of AI, and I'm an optimist. I think it's fascinating and amazing, especially since I've seen literally 20 years ago where it started and how it's now progressed and continues to progress. And so what I'd like to do is talk about the future of this industry and the things that excite me. So there's a bunch of things that are out there, but the things that I think will really enable us to embrace this world of AI and really increase its value. So one of those, and we've mentioned many, many times about the data being out there. That's actually one of the big keys of why we are at this amazing place that we are. There's so much data that's there, that's coming in, but we're also able to process it. We're able to take this information, come up with useful trends, come up with useful predictions based on that data. And so businesses can think about how do you optimize their workflow. Companies can think about how do I provide more value to the consumers? And so you have companies like Rab that are taking this information and increasing the value of what we have. And those are the things. Some of it is because it has no longer become a mobile first world, it's become an AI first world. And we also have all these resources now in terms of open source and these tools where anyone who's halfway smart can download and figure out, oh, what is this thing called TensorFlow? I have no idea, but let's download it and think about how to apply machine learning and AI to my data set. And so this is really interesting and allows us to do many, many things that allow us to have quality of life. So the three things I want to talk about of what excites me about AI in the future. So what is wearables and why is this? So if you think about the data that's out there, a lot of times people think, people think about data as your online presence. 
your search patterns, your shopping habits, when you buy a ticket that go from Singapore to the States. But there's another source of data that companies are just starting to tap into. And it's the things that we have on our person, our worlds. And I will guarantee in this room, it's probably at least 99.9% .9 of you have a world. How many of you think you have a world one? Okay, I want to see a few hands. How many of you have a cell phone on you or a smartphone? Exactly. That is your wearable device. Do you know how many sensors are in the phone? They have data on it. They're tracking your every little habits. You can have a cell phone that sits on your hip, and I can determine your gait. And by your gait, I can tell if you're tired today or yesterday or tomorrow. I can predict that. With your cell phone, so think about this. This is this tool that basically everyone has, whether you're in the United States or Singapore or Africa, pretty much everyone has this sensor. And so that is a fascinating world because that's another data source that companies are only just now starting to peek into in order to have much more personalized interaction. The video I show here, we actually make wearables in my group for infants. Yeah, infants don't carry cell phones, but you know what they do? They wear baby suits. And so we're designing wearables for babies so that we can also track their movements and figure out, are they tired? Are they agitated? Is it time to eat in two hours? Again, wearables have this amazing thing that we can do. The other thing I'm excited about is this aspect of collaborative AI. Um, so it was mentioned um, about how people are the center of some of these systems. And it's true. People are the center of the new generation of AI systems. And what that means is that we as humans, we, we're still good at some stuff. Like whether people believe it or not, there are some talents and skills we're still good at. And there are some things that AI is not. And so collaborative AI is taking advantage of our skills. And some of it, they say we're more creative. We can problem solve in new situations. I can go to another country and probably find some food, even though I've never been there. Like these are habits that we kind of develop from kids and we continue on to adults. And so how do you take the things that we're good at and combine it with the things that AI is good at, which is understanding, repetition, predictive behavior, analytics, and combine that into one so that we have optimized experiences, whether it's in our companies in terms of increasing our workflow and our efficiency, or it's in our homes, helping kids in terms of learning, or teachers are in hospitals. Um, this video I show is us using collaborative AI to help aquanauts, so aquanauts are astronauts when they do training underwater, and looking at how do you design robotic and AI systems to help astronauts actually perform better and more effectively when we do send them off to the moon at some point one day in the future. So this is this aspect of collaborative AI that is just at the beginning point of really making a difference and being integrated into different work functions and in the home, I mean, especially in the hospitals. Then the other one is emotional AI. So there's been a lot that's talked about in terms of AI being emotional. It was discussed about how uh, the system, one of the speakers talked earlier, was using AI to identify or prevent, hopefully, this aspects of mental health, depression, suicide. And so if you think about this aspect, you always think about the human in terms of the emotion. But what about the AI agent? Well, believe it or not, when you have an agent that understands our emotions, but also is emotional, it will do things that improve us. It will do things such as behave and not make us go crazy sometimes if it actually has a conscience. And so when we think about emotional AI, it's not having an AI um, that's really emotional, like it cries, which makes no sense, but that it actually understands the different aspects of what does frustration mean? And so if I'm working with a person and we're doing this collaborative task and I recognize that it's frustrated, this person is frustrated, if I understand what frustration is, it means that I might stop and say, oh, it's time for a break, it's time for coffee. But if I don't understand that, I might push, and I might push, and I might push, and then I break that relationship with the human that I'm working with. So that's really this aspect of emotional AI, is understanding that people are part of the equation. 
And we actually have emotions, and so we need to understand that, and the agent therefore has to understand that. And so combined, these are the three things I'm really excited about in terms of we're just starting, we're at the beginning stages. Companies are just starting to think about how to integrate these aspects, but it will open up so many possibilities and so many opportunities for the future. Now I'm gonna to go to the dark side, the doom and gloom messages. So people trust AI. And when I say trust, I don't mean having a survey and say, you know, do you trust, do you love AI? People say, of course not. What I'm talking about is trust in terms of behaviors. People trust their technology, i.e. they use their technology, and if their technology says something like, here's the map, and here's the directions, and this is where you're gonna go, people will follow it without even really thinking about whether it's right or wrong, if it's efficient or optimal. They just kind of say, oh, some smart people did this. Okay, I trust this technology based on the behavior. And so the concerns are that with that trust, we are doing a couple of things that are wrong. And I actually don't blame the AI systems, I actually blame us. So two of the big concerns, one is, it was mentioned about data privacy. So think about it, when you go into a store and you walk around and you look at all the pretty things and you may touch the cloths and you look around, you don't expect someone to come and say, um, because you were looking, you owe me $100, right? We don't expect that. And yet, when we go online, and we look at our Facebook posts, we are actually paying to do that. Now we're not paying it $100, but we're paying it with our data. The data is ours, we own it. Just like that $100 is something that we own, our data, we do own it. And so I worry about the fact that we are willing to give up our data for an emoji, we're willing to give up our data for a retweet, and all of this. We are not willing to give up our data at a store if there's $100. And so we really need to rethink about how we give our data. It's okay to ask Facebook to pay us for our data if we all did it. And so those are the things I think about in terms of the concerns, but also what we can do. The other thing I worry about is this aspect of how these systems are designed and built. Um, so when I look at the systems that are in the U.S., they are designed by folks that have a very U.S.-centric point of view. And guess what? If I come to Singapore, I actually see some of the same apps that are on the phones based on data and developers and designers from the U.S. So what do you think the outcome is going to be with respect to that application? Guarantee it has a different perspective. And so the other thing that I'm concerned about is that when we create these technologies, that we are not thinking that the technology we make might actually end up being used by everyone in the world. And yet we are very focused on our own community because we wanted to work there, but because we're so interconnected in so many ways, there is no guarantee that it's gonna stay. And so I worry about that. And so I always say, when we're thinking about technology, even if it be so in Singapore, it might actually be used someplace else. Or we're in the US, it might actually be used someplace else. And so that's the other concern. Because otherwise, we're gonna have technology, like was mentioned with the facial recognition at the front door here, that works for some, but not for everyone. But people are gonna trust it, and so they're gonna still continue to use it. So what's next? I really think I'm an optimist. I think the things we can do with AI are great and amazing, improve our quality of life in so many aspects, health, education, having access to things that we may not have had access before. But I also know that there's these concerns, and I've talked about two, but what's nice about it is that we have the power to actually make a difference and make it so that those concerns are just concerns, that they are not actually reality in the future. And so with that, uh, I think we're okay as long as we're all on the same name of being happy. So with that, I think we can seize the moment and we can ensure that AI is even smarter. Thank you. <laughs>